Chicago Bears head coach Matt Eberflus is putting together an impressive coaching staff. We'll get to know his top assistants, their backgrounds, their track records, and their reputations on today's podcast. This is Locked On Bears, and I'm your host, Lauren Cox. I'm an analyst for Pro Football Focus, and I'm here to bring you your daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. You can follow me on Twitter at Cox Sports One. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On Bears. You can like Locked On Bears on Facebook. Join the Locked On Bears Facebook group for even more Bears talk. And make sure you hit that subscribe button on the Locked On Bears YouTube channel to keep up with all of our video podcasts as well. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today and every day. On the show today, we're getting to know new Bears quarterback coach Andrew Janoki from the Minnesota Vikings. New wide receivers coach Tyke Tolbert from the New York Giants, and really a long list of coaching stops for him, as well as new offensive line coach Chris Morgan, most notably from the Atlanta Falcons, but last year with the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think we all know the most important position on this team moving forward, though, is going to be the quarterbacks. And so, of course, there was a lot of attention paid to new offensive coordinator Luke Getze and that decision made to bring him in. And now, even more so, I think, looking more specifically at the coach that will be directly coaching Justin Fields' position, Andrew Janoko. Very interesting resume and a guy that I think we can be encouraged about, but still have very real questions, maybe not concerns, but questions that we just can't always fully tell from the outside. Because Janoko's got a real interesting background with the Minnesota Vikings. I was talking to Luke Braun from Lockdown Vikings, just sort of exchanging texts, you know, not not really enough to bring him on the podcast to talk about the Vikings quarterback coach, but you know, just sort of getting some extra background that we might not be able to get just from, you know, whatever research we can do on our own, not covering the team. And, and Luke was telling me about how, like, basically they see Andrew Janoko from the Vikings as the next Kevin Stefanski, who is now the Cleveland Browns head coach. He was the Vikings offensive coordinator in the sense of how they worked their way up through those organizations. And of course, Vikings fans disappointed to lose Janoko because of this reputation that he's carried with him. He came to the Vikings as an offensive quality control coach, then was the assistant offensive line coach with Tony Sperano. Tony Sperano passed away. There was, they kind of had to reshuffle with the offensive line coach, coaching there. Then he took over as wide receivers coach for a year and then quarterbacks coach this past season. And that's very similar to to the same type of path Stefanski had also throughout the Vikings organization. Running backs coach, tight ends coach, quarterbacks coach, offensive coordinator, and then, of course, head coach of the Cleveland Browns. It's not to say that Janoko is going to be a stellar offensive coordinator and future NFL head coach, not necessarily, but similar type of path as someone in that same organization doing a lot of the same things and being a very well-rounded, respected coach that is trusted to coach a lot of different positions. And that says something, right? That it's not just a guy that you just stick on one spot because you just... You know, he doesn't have a wide enough grasp of, you know, the offense or whatever details might need to be able to coach those positions at the level you need to be a position coach in the NFL. On the flip side, he's not, his resume certainly doesn't scream out like quarterback specialist, right? This is not a guy who has this this long track record of developing these quarterbacks here and those quarterbacks there throughout his different stops or like clear evidence of like, okay, Here's how great he is specifically at working with quarterbacks. It's kind of a double-edged sword there. But I, I don't know that he needs to be purely a quarterback specialist. But, it, you know, we just I think this is what I mean, like, like question. It doesn't mean it's necessarily a concern, but just like a, a true question there. I mean, if you want to get like more of a really specific grasp of how Andrew Janoko like teaches quarterbacks, you can actually watch for yourself. This is not a an advertisement, but there's a website called CoachTube that – has videos of coaching clinics that you have to pay for to of a lot of NFL and college coaches. And there's an Andrew Janoko coaching clinic on a three-step passing game concept where he breaks down, okay, here's how they go through their slant flats, you know, all the different pass, you know, the curls, which of course we've had enough of, but like he breaks down how they go through all those different concepts and teach it in Minnesota and, you know, everywhere he's coached in, in the past before that. So you can actually see some of his offensive teaching style and some of the things that he goes through there. If you want to pay, I think it's like, Thirty dollars to be able to watch the whole thing, but anyway, you know, it, it is a little bit hard because, you know, we don't get to see this this like large sample size. You know, one year as a quarterbacks coach, one year as a wide receivers coach. He was the assistant offensive line coach for a while, but they weren't they weren't a great offensive line over that time. They didn't also didn't really have offensive line talent. I will say though, Andrew Janoko played quarterback in college at Pittsburgh, so like he's not coming in as just some 
guy who's never played the, you know, doesn't, doesn't know the position, right? It helps a lot, I think, that he has played quarterback at at least the Division One college level, even though he was a backup who didn't really play much at Pittsburgh, but still practiced in, at that level. Played with LaShawn McCoy at Pittsburgh. Also, I think, one year with Aaron Donald crossing over there because Janoko's only 33 years old, so definitely more of a young, ascending-type quarterback coach as opposed to, like, the experienced veteran quarterback coach. And so I think for Justin Fields, you know, you could – this is, can be a Rorschach test for, I think, like Chicago media members and, and analysts and even fans on Twitter. It's like, what do you want to see what, – what do you want to believe Janoko is? Is he a young, inexperienced guy who's not ready to develop Justin Fields and then you're worried about them not hiring the right coach there? Or is he a young, up-and-coming, versatile, talented, well-liked coach who's – potentially going to be a future offensive coordinator someday and going to be this this guy who just goes on this great path forward and could be a very good influence on Justin Fields. I think you could make an argument really either way, and that's why I'm sort of I'm, I'm willing to say, hey, I have questions, but I'm not necessarily like directly concerned. And I think the feeling from the Vikings was that they were not thrilled about losing him in this way, but that happens with a new coaching staff. I will say this, though. With Fields specifically, it's not like you need to tear down Fields' whole mechanics and rebuild him as a quarterback, right? We're not trying to take make chicken salad out of chicken crap in the in this case right you have a, you already have a really talented quarterback he just needs you know steady guidance little tweaking here and there so you don't need a complete quarterback guru per se to just like completely fix rebuild and break down Justin Fields like as though he was like some completely broken quarterback like he more importantly like needs an offensive coordinator and a general manager to build an offense around him both a system and a talent base to help put him in a position to be successful. And so, like, that's not to downplay the importance of a good quarterback coach, absolutely, but more so that, like, Fields doesn't need, he doesn't need, like, in-depth, this is not this raw prospect that needs to be molded into something good. He already has a lot of the talent. It's just about trying to fine-tune things a little bit more and build so much more around him. So I don't think there's any reason to, to get over the moon about Janoki or panic completely about Janoki because I think it's more so going to be a bigger picture offensive and team building thing that will lead to Fields' success rather than specifically who his quarterback coach will be. That's not to say it's not important, but just let's let's make sure we're keeping it in the right perspective here, somewhere in the middle between the the two potential ends here. Also, think it's going to be critical that they develop the talent around Justin Fields particularly well. The other coaches coaching the other positions, and the Bears absolutely nailed their hiring of wide receivers coach Tyke Tolbert. Just beloved, really respected veteran wide receivers coach. We'll go through a long list of impressive names of receivers he's worked with and what the future could hold for that position in Chicago next on Locked on Bears. Hey, Bears fans, I want to tell you about an incredible app for anyone who ever buys gasoline. It's called Get Upside, and listeners of Locked on Bears are earning free cash back for every gallon of gas they purchase every time they fill up. You just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play and use it every time you fill up. It's super easy. You don't have to pay full price at the pump ever again. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to $300 a year in cash back, and there's no catch. The cash back gets added right into your Get Upside account, and then you can cash out literally at any time. If you want to connect your bank account, they can do a direct deposit, make it nice and simple. You can go through PayPal or even cash out with e-gift cards to online retailers like Amazon and other stores. So download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play and enter in our promo code TOUCHDOWN. And you're going to get 25 cents per gallon or more cash back when you fill up your tank, just like you would any other time at the gas station. That's promo code TOUCHDOWN when you download the Get Upside app. Based on everything we can tell on paper and on the outside, New Bears wide receivers coach Tyke Tolbert should be a massive upgrade over what was a disappointment with Mike Furry under the Matt Nagy regime. I mean, Tolbert's reputation, just being down here at the Senior Bowl here in Mobile, Alabama, where I'm recording this podcast, the buzz was, was very real, talking to people down here that have, I mean, he's been on a, a number of organizations and, and has touched a lot of different coaches and even media members that have just gotten to know him from covering him at these different spots. And like, it, it's it's a reputation. It's not necessarily direct translation to being great in Chicago, but like it's very real, impressive, known by everybody, beloved, veteran wide receiver, like expert. Like this is what he does. He coaches wide receivers at a very high level, and you can really see it in the track record of quality receivers he's coached. Pretty much, 
I mean, literally everywhere he's been in the NFL. You know, he came directly from the New York Giants as their wide receivers coach. And not that they had, like, stellar passing offenses, but that was a little more about the quarterback. I mean, you look, Sterling Shepard at wide receiver certainly helped develop him to something bigger and better. And Kadarius Toney really impressing as a rookie. And even Darius Slayton had some flashes in there, coached Odell Beckham a little while early. I think, you know, very... I think his last year there was, was Tolbert's first year in New York. I'm not 100% positive on that. But before that, he was with the Denver Broncos. And in, the, in that Peyton Manning Super Bowl winning year, Demarius Thomas on one side, Eric Decker on the other side. Again, not that Tolbert took them from nothing and made them into something phenomenal, but like coached quality wide receivers and helped wide receivers have very, very productive seasons. Before that, it was the Carolina Panthers. He coached Brandon LaFell and a few others there. Long time with the Buffalo Bills prior to that, where he coached Lee Evans, Stevie Johnson, among others there. Some really just like solid, you know, not necessarily like Hall of Fame caliber wide receivers. that Because it's just not realistic that everywhere you go, you're going to coach a Hall of Famer. But like st- steady, solid number one, number two wide receivers uh, across all of these stops. And then even early on, he was with the Arizona Cardinals for Anquan Bolden's rookie year. When he was, you may remember, Offensive Rookie of the Year. I think that was 2003. And not to say that Tolbert deserves all the credit for Anquan Bolden becoming Rookie of the Year. I mean, Anquan Bolden was a very good prospect coming out of college. So, like, But still, right, he, he's been there for not one, but five teams I just went through there. Yeah, five five different teams with you know at least one or two like quality number one, number two type wide receivers across the board. And so I, I just think we're going to notice at least some level of, of difference. I mean, it's going to be hard to tell the exact difference from Mike Furry just in the sense that, like, this Bears wide receiver position is going to be opened, I think, pretty pretty wide up this season because they only have one wide receiver wide receiver under contract for 2022. Like, once Furry, I mean, before they, if they re-sign somebody, it changes. But, like, as of right now, the only wide receiver here for week one is Darnell Mooney. And so it's a blank slate. It's time to build build your own wide receiver core. I mean, it's going to be Tyke Tolbert and Luke Getze and Matt Eberflus and, and Ryan Pulse saying, okay, what types of wide receivers are we going to want around Justin Fields? I'm guessing, given that you have one under contract, you're, you're going to have to sign for agents, and you're probably also going to draft at least one wide receiver. I mean, it's a good idea to pretty much draft a wide receiver every year because it seems like in every single draft, there is a significant deep class of late round guys that end up playing really well of course early round guys that are huge difference makers I haven't gone deep into this wide receiver draft class yet this year but the last two podcasts breaking down or I guess last week's two last week's podcast breaking down the senior bowl we talked about wide receivers especially on that would have been Thursday's podcast of day two senior bowl we talked about the wide receivers in particular but we got a little bit of them on Wednesday's podcast from day one of the senior bowl if you want some of those potential draft prospects to keep an eye on that we've gotten to see down here in Mobile, Alabama in person. But like, I, I think as you're building out this wide receiver core, it's it's nice to then to have a coach like this that has worked with really talented guys of a lot of different skill sets. We'll know, you know, we'll know what he wants to bring in and then we'll be able to get them then up to speed into their offense and develop them and bring them along, whether they're a rookie or, or a veteran, because he'll then be also the passing game coordinator in addition to wide receivers coach. So then he can coordinate his and, and gets his passing game to the wide receiver talent that they choose to bring in, right? It's not like he's inheriting this full receiving core and they have to then like tilt the offense toward them. No, they're they're it's a slate blank slate right now with the offense and with the receivers. And so you can get exactly the types of guys that you're gonna want around Justin Fields in order to get as successful of an offense as possible. You know, I, th- I think when you compare it to what we saw from Mike Furry, we, we just never saw development or a lot of consistency from receivers. We've talked about before the Darnell Mooney thing, where it's like, yes, Mike Furry was the wide receivers coach the last two years when Darnell Mooney played really well and and surprised as a fifth-round pick. Does Mike Furry deserve some credit for that? Sure, I, th- I think something. But, for, but Mooney comes in as a rookie and starts week one as a fifth-round pick from a, a group of five school tells me that Mooney came in you know, better than we thought he would. It wasn't like in the, what is it, the four months between the draft and week one that Mike Furry built Darnell Mooney into who he is today, right? I mean, I'm sure there was some of that, but not not like a complete rebuild and, and 
talent of of that wide receiver. So that's why I, you know, I, I don't I, I don't give Furry too much credit for for Darnell Looney in the same way that I wasn't giving Tolbert too much credit for Anquan Bolden, right? You know, in, in the five months between the draft and Week One, he didn't make Bolden into a Rookie of the Year. He was he maybe helped, but didn't you know Bolden came in with a lot of that stuff. Whereas like Furry, you saw Robinson have a drop off over his years and really <laughs> sputter out pretty bad this past season. Anthony Miller never developed into the wide receiver that we wanted him to be. Javon Wims never took those next steps. Riley Ridley was a massive bust as a fourth-round pick. Even like Cordero Patterson was brought in to be a, a wide receiver slash running back. I mean, and they never really figured that out. I'm not going to put too much of that on Mike Furry, but like you, you can say, well, Miller was a, a head case or whatever, and Wims had, had, you know, was between the ears problems. Sure, but like talking like four different wide receivers examples here like you can make excuses for each one but when it happens four times you know fool me once shame on me fool me four times maybe not a great wide receivers coach or just not for what the bears had in mind and so that's where i'm excited to see tolbert not only have that track record of being a better receiving coach but also have the ability to bring in a brand new cast of wide receivers and truly build around justin fields that's what's so exciting about where this bears offense could start sort of going from here i'm also intrigued by the way they're building this offensive coaching staff so far you know you've got i mean I, between tolbert and then also Janoko, you know there's not really super obvious ties that i find right away to matt eberflus or luke getzi right i mean I'm, there might be something that i'm just that maybe they knew each other from some spate but like it's not like there's an obvious place where they both coached together and like oh they just bring in his buddies from when they used to coach together no i mean you're getting a wide breadth of thoughts and ideas coming into how you want to sort of build this assistant coaching staff and I think that can be a very good thing to have you know a lot of different perspectives in there it's also a double-edged sword because I think we saw Matt Nagy struggle with that a little bit when on his first coaching staff bringing in a lot of different guys he'd never worked with before with Mark Helfrich and Harry Heastand and you know a lot of these guys and didn't didn't all mesh together the way they thought it might so it, it can be good or bad it's not inherently one way or the other but just interesting to see how this Bears coaching staff is indeed starting to come together. A really big part of how this offense can come together is going to be what happens with that offensive line. It's going to be a big focus for the new GM, Ryan Poles, and I think the new offensive line coach is going to be an interesting hire to sort of see how they build out this group as we could see some potential turnover up front. We'll get to know new offensive line coach Chris Morgan and some of the stops he's been on and what it could mean for what this Bears offense looks like next on Locked on Bears. Today's episode of Locked on Bears brought to you by the makers of the world's best tasting protein bars, Built Bars. Because Built Bars don't taste like other protein bars. Some of the other products can be, you know, chalky or waxy or just hard to, you know, like a cardboard, hard to chew type of taste. But no, Built Bars are different because Built Bars taste like candy bars. They're soft. They're easy to chew. They're covered in 100% real chocolate. They come in a bunch of delicious flavors. I promise you'll, you'll find one you love. I, I have brought a raspberry Built Bar with me down here to Mobile for the Senior Bowl to have a nice little snack that tastes delicious, but also fills me up and is good for me because all Built Bars are low sugar, low calories, high fiber, and high protein. You can't find this combination of nutrients and taste anywhere else. So head on over to built.com, enter in our promo code LOCKED15, and you're going to get 15% off your next order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. New offensive line coach Chris Morgan doesn't bring quite as robust of a track record in terms of like players and offensive lines that he's had a direct hand in building really, really elite units necessarily, but he does come from a really strong system fit and background with the type of offense Luke Getzey's going to want to run that should bode well for Justin Fields. So most, most recently, Chris Morgan was the assistant offensive line coach for the Steelers last season, but prior to that, he had been the Atlanta Falcons offensive line coach for six seasons under Dan Quinn from like 2015 to 2020. So, you know, you wonder if there's still some connections there with Ryan Poles being close with Matt Ryan and Matt Ryan knowing his offensive line coach. I wonder if there was some communication or connection there to help sort of build and bring all this together. He also does come from the same coaching tree as Getzy and Shanahan and, and the you know that whole thing with with my, with the floor as well. We'll get into that here a, a little bit as we kind of go along here. But that that Falcons offensive line was a group that I think kind of waxed and waned a bit. Never had a, a stellar reputation as being like always the the most solid group. But like I think like last the last couple of years, and so it wasn't Morgan this past season, but even like the year before that, like it was starting to come together. Then as the Falcons started investing more like early draft picks 
in the offensive line. And, you know, like uh, Chris Morgan, he coached Jake Matthews, who he didn't draft, but was coached Matthews for all six of those seasons as a pretty solid left tackle there. They, they brought in Alex Mack from Cleveland and had some really quality center play when he was healthy and on the field that I think stabilized a lot from the interior. But you know, they, were, they had some real, I think, guard troubles in particular. And the right tackle spot was rotating quite a bit for a while there. But then, like, 2019, they draft Chris Lindstrom in the first round, and he's been a really solid force for them. And then, what, 2020, was it, that they drafted Caleb McGrary, the the, the right tackle? And, you know, honestly, I don't think McGrary has necessarily been stellar, right? I mean, he hasn't been a terrible offensive tackle. He's been a, con- he's been a consistent enough starter, but not necessarily the difference maker. I would have liked to see maybe – a little bit more progress there as a, as a potential, you know, as a first round pick coming in, but that's not to say he's been like a bust or anything, but kind of in that, you know, under as underwhelming, too strong a word. I haven't sat down and broken down a lot of Caleb McGarry tape, but just from what I've seen from the Falcons, I just, you know, that there's a questions there for, for, for Chris Morgan about what, what we could see in terms of his development. But you know, I think his offensive line was really good early on with the Falcons too. Like it was good. And then it kind of dropped off and then it started getting good again as he, as Dan Quinn was fired and the coaching staff was let go. Cause I think you know, like when they went on that Super Bowl run, they had Matt Ryan really well protected a, a decent running game in there too, I believe so. And like it, it all kind of came together nicely. And then it seemed like they, they brought in some more like just like less heralded offensive line talent, some sh- kind of shoddy veteran type. Some guys were getting older, and it just, I don't know, it didn't seem like, and I think there were some injuries there too. And it just didn't seem like they were necessarily putting the best pieces forward. And so I, I don't want to kill Morgan too much for when the Falcons offensive line struggled, but would like to see him maybe be able to get a little bit more out of those guys. But also, the offensive coordinator changed. Kyle Shanahan leaves, and they bring in what Steve Sarkeesian and then Dirk Ketter. And like, don't get me wrong. Dirk Ketter's been a very good offensive coach, and Sark has, has been as well, more so in college. But, like, when you when you lose the, the Kyle Shanahan, it definitely was a big drop-off for Matt Ryan. And so I wonder if not executing the scheme at as high of a level also hurt the offensive line because it is an offensive line-friendly scheme under Kyle Shanahan. And that's the key here is that that's what Luke Getze comes from and is trying to bring here for Justin Fields. It's that same sort of stretch zone, you know, play action rollout type offense that we saw the Bears do some of with Mitch Trubisky at the end of, you know, two years ago now, technically, when, with the season over. And 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 so I think if there's a natural sort of synergy here. You know, I, I don't think Chris Morgan ever directly coached with Luke Getze, but because he coached under Shanahan with the Falcons, and I, I believe he was with Shanahan in Washington. He it was... It was, I know, and I think Lafleur was there in Washington. Like it was, it was Lafleur, Shanahan, and McVay on that Washington coaching staff. Chris Morgan was their assistant offensive line coach from 2011 to 2013. So it wasn't directly Getzy, but it was that same system and that same terminology that he's going to be very much on the same page with his offensive coordinator. And he was briefly the running game coordinator with the Falcons' offensive line. We'll see. It doesn't sound like for now that he's going to get that title with the Bears, but I, I don't know. It hasn't been said for sure that he's not. I guess from, from what I can tell, but it's still that same system and, and and that sort of run game symmetry with with the offensive coordinator and the offensive line coach should help kind of keep things on track and keep that offensive identity a little bit more secure in that same type of path and I think that's going to shape some of how they want to build this Bears offensive line the Bears were already running a lot of zone under Matt Nagy and certainly we saw it fluctuate under laser when they changed the offense for Mitch Trubisky, but like they were much more of like an inside zone team and versus the outside zone that we could see under this Shanahan offensive system. And so like that doesn't necessarily drastically change the profile of offensive linemen that you're looking for. But generally speaking, you're going to want more athletic guys that can move fairly well. I mean, they still need to be strong, but you're not going to want as many of those big, slow plotting phone booth type interior offensive linemen. And that's sort of, where we're looking right now for the Bears, because you got Tevin Jenkins is going to be one of your futures at one of the tackle spots, and Larry Borum probably going to be your future at one of the others, or at least going to get a darn good shot to be your future at those tackle spots. I don't think it precludes the Bears from bringing in a veteran offensive lineman and letting the three of them compete and say, okay, our two best offensive line, or our two best offensive tackles are going to start, and the third one will be the backup, whether it's Borum, Jenkins, or a veteran in that some order. Two of them will start, and one will be a backup. You know, that's how I might go about trying to fix that part of the offensive line. But then, like the interior. Sam Mustafer is a free agent, got to upgrade at center. James Daniels is a free agent and hasn't played, you know, bad, but hasn't been stellar 
either. And as as a young free agent, if he's going to cash in and get a big deal from someone, I'm not willing to pay him $10 million a year. He's not been a $10 million a year guard for the Bears. I just can't do it. He's been too inconsistent at times. And then so, plus, Ryan Poles has kind of been very specific about saying he wants to upgrade the offensive line and has been disappointed in maybe a lack of toughness from that group. And he talks specifically about, you know, when your quarterback's hit and wanting to to, to protect and defend him and go over and help him up and all those different things that this Bears offensive line struggled to do. And, and Tevin Jenkins was really the only one more consistently doing it for that, you know, in that moment at the end of the season where Jermaine Effetti was like shoving him for having shoved an opponent. Like, yeah, that's not going to happen anymore under polls. They're going to emphasize what Jenkins did. And I think Jermaine Effetti is long gone from this Bears offensive line. So there's going to be at least, I would think, for sure at least one new starter, if not two or even potentially three as they rebuild that group. And I think you're, you're looking for that type of Shanahan offensive lineman that can move a little bit more, but also has to be tough and physical. It's not necessarily about being the biggest, strongest guy, but still being really, I think, an ass kicker is what they're looking for. They want a tough, mean, nasty offensive line that can move. And that doesn't necessarily describe what they've gotten from James Daniels so far and certainly not what they've gotten from Sam Mustafa and not what they got from Jermaine Effetti. Or, or, and that's why I think we're going to see maybe more turnover there than you might expect. Cody Whitehair will start somewhere, and Tevin Jenkins will likely start somewhere. Those are the only two that I think I will guarantee or should, or I'm pretty confident, will be talented enough and fit the mold to start somewhere. But from there, it could be any combination of the guys that are already here and guys potentially from outside of the organization. Really curious to see what the plan is going to be for that group up front and the rest of this Bears offense as we find out more philosophically what they want to do as they round out the rest of their coaching staff. We haven't even gone into the guys on the defensive side of the ball, so there is a lot more to break down right here on the Locked On Bears podcast. We're here for you five days a week, so make sure you hit that subscribe button to keep up with all of our daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. I should say, we're normally here for you five days a week, but this week, coming off the Senior Bowl, going to take a couple of days off here. Actually, I have a vacation planned immediately I'm leaving Mobile, Alabama, not even going home. I'm going down into Florida and, and going to enjoy some more warm weather before I get back to the snowy, cold uh, upper Midwest there around Lake Michigan. It has not been a pleasant few weeks of winter that I've been avoiding down here and going to keep avoiding just a, a little bit more. And so going to take a couple of days off on the podcast this week. I should be back Thursday and Friday. So I think you'll get three this week, but this will this will kick us off and then we'll have a couple of days off and we'll be back for more and then we'll get right back in the spring of coaching staff, free agency, NFL draft, and so much more. So thanks for making Locked on Bears your first listen today and every day. A heads up, we'll be we'll have the Locked on Podcast Network crew at the Super Bowl for Radio Row, getting some great in-depth interviews. We'll play some of those for you on the podcast. If we get former Bears players, legends, coaches, etc., we'll have lots of goodies coming for you all week long. So keep tuning in, keep coming back for more, and most importantly, I hope the Locked on Bears podcast makes it just a little bit easier for you to bear down.